Good evening and welcome to the Zoning Board of Appeals December 15, 2022 meeting. The time being 7 o'clock p.m. Alexander Terenzio requests a special permit pursuant to the Code of the Town of Foxborough, Massachusetts, Chapter 275 Zoning, Section 3.1.6, Table 3-1, Table of Uses, Use L5, <clears throat> to construct a detached 30-foot by 40-foot residential garage with a footprint of 1,200 square feet. The subject property is located at 83 Beat Street, Foxborough, Massachusetts, in the R40 Residential and Agricultural District. Is Mr. Terenzio here? Yep. You want to come up? Are you Alec? Yes, sir. Okay, before I let you begin, I have a disclosure to make. Uh, this is a disclosure of appearance of conflict of interest, uh, which is required by General Laws Chapter 268, Section 23B3. Um, I'm a personal friend of one of the abutters to, um, to the subject property. Um, I've talked with him. He has absolutely no position on the matter. He's neither opposed nor in favor of it. And taking that into account, and I, I feel that I am able to sit on this matter without any, um, any conflict. So unless you have an issue, okay, no issue here? Okay. So as you can see, there are four of us here. Je that gentleman there, Mr. Brown. Um, Mr. Brown, Ms. Mellon, and I are the regular members of the board. Mr. Yagin and Ms. Ms. Brew are associate members. All of us participate, but only the three regular members, he, me, and this young lady here will be the ones who are, vote, who are voting. <clears throat> and in order to approve your application, our vote must be unanimous. Okay, mm -hmm. go ahead. Tell us what you want to do and we'll ask you some questions. Uh, should I press this? Or, oh, it's all set. So my plan is to build a 30 by 40 foot uh, go detached garage at 83 Beach Street. Um, so what we did is we finished off both of the basement sides on the two units, uh, 83 and 85. So now it's like two townhouses as opposed to a raised ranch. And uh, we'd now like to use that garage as the basement storage, which we used at the property. How, how high is the, um, the garage itself? Um, I can check on the plans. I know the interior height is gonna be 12 feet. Um, but the plans should tell me how high. So I have five twelve pitch, and then so let me see what that is. Well, let me ask you this. Does it exceed 21 feet from ground to? No, okay. definitely not 21 feet. Okay. And you're showing space for two vehicles, which would roughly be about 625 square feet. So you have roughly another 600 feet as storage area. Yeah, that would make sense. Yeah. Okay. Is um, above the level where the vehicles would be parked. Is there going to be a no there? Yes. So it would be uh, trusses. Do you know trusses? So it's exposed on attic space. In the right, boards. right, yeah. Be exposed? Yes, exposed, okay. yeah. It's slab on grade, I presume? Yep. No basement, right? No basement, yep. Okay. And you're showing a uh, bathroom, correct? Yeah, but we're going to take that out as we were told. It's, we're not allowed to have water connection. Okay. Dave, Kirk, go ahead with any questions. Um, I do have a few, uh, few questions. So this is going to be visible from the street? Yes. Okay. 
And uh, will you occupy the residence? I will be at 83 Beach Street, yes. Okay, so you're, okay. I'm sorry, you will be? Oh, yeah. yes, I'll be living at 83 and then 85 will be a tenant. Okay. Okay. And there's two units that you said. Um, do you, if we were to approve this, do you have any intention of using this for any uh, business use, commercial no. use? No. Okay. That is all I have for the moment. Okay. Dave, any questions? No. Um, <coughs> what, I have quite a bit of storage space, right? I heard storage I mean, space. That was sorry. All. Dave, could you repeat that? Can you guys hear me all right? Slightly. Can you turn no. up your volume. Turn up my volume. Here we go. Great. How do I do that? <coughs> I guess not. Uh, Kurt, any questions? Is that better? Oh, wait. That battery said. No. <clears throat> if it's helpful on the line, we can hear him fine. Is that better? No. It sounds kind of echoey. How about now? Is oh, that there you better? go. That's, That's better, better, Dave. Okay, I figured it out. One more. How about that? <laughs> yes. <laughs> any, any questions? Um, that's quite a bit of uh, space for storage. What, what kind of things do you expect to store there? Uh, so I've flipped five houses now, uh, ranging from 1800s to 1900s. In every house I do, I keep as much lumber as I possibly can. So I have tons of 300-year-old lumber that I'd like to use eventually, you know, make some pieces of furniture for myself. But I have a lot of lumber that's all stored under tarps right now. I'd love to have in a garage. So the lumber is used towards other construction, flipping houses? Yeah, construction and then, you know, furniture pieces for myself, just miscellaneous, anything I can recycle it for. So it's part of, then it is part of a business. No, no not like, so it, I'd say more of a hobby. Oh. The, the furniture that you prepare. Yeah, hard. I haven't gotten to it yet, but eventually I'd like to make like a dining room table for my house and mm -hmm. stuff like that. So if you're going to be manufacturing furniture, you're probably going to need what? Room for equipment to, to manufacture it? Well, I have that, yeah. I mean, where, where is that now? In my trailer, yeah. So everything be, is just in my trailer now. Putting that, that in the garage? Uh, yeah. Does that run on single phase or two phase electric? Or? Single phase, yeah, it's just the biggest is a table saw right now. And when you're flipping houses, you have employees? Uh, no. Subcontractors? Yes. And do they go directly to the jobs or do they come into you or how does that all work? What do you mean, do they come directly to me? Well, where do they report in the morning? Um, well, they just kind of, like if they have their job, they go and do their job on whichever house we're on. Yeah, they don't really report to me. They kind of just have their job and do their job. And they bring their own equipment directly yeah. to the job? Yeah, they all have their own equipment. Okay. Nothing for Okay. Kurt, any questions? I uh, presume the garage is going to be, you know, keeping in context with the house as far as style, color, yep. that kind of Same thing. Same vinyl setting, yep. 
Uh, yeah, that's that's all I have. Lorraine. So, quick question: Is this a single-family home that has been converted into two units? At one point, yeah, like 30 years ago, they converted it. 30 years ago. Yeah, before me, a long okay. time before me. And we just, we made the two family a lot more spacious. We used the basement. So that's something that would be even, that's like pre-existing, non-conforming? That, that was a question that I asked Diana originally. And I think we said the house was constructed in 1968 and it was allowed as a two-family at that point. I think it was 1980, but it was allowed as a two-family. Like, there's applications to the Board of Health for a two-family septic yeah. and everything. So, however they did it back then, it okay. was allowed. And at one time in the 1960s, probably even going to the 1970s, um, two-family homes were allowed in the R40. Oh, okay. Um, hmm. If you have any time you want to look at old zoning bylaw provisions, give Frank Spillane a call. Okay. <laughs> um, the one he and I were looking at was only about 15 pages long. Okay. Thank you. Um, the, the space in the garage that would be, quote, unquote, used for storage yeah. would be both for you and the other tenant? And the other tenant, yeah. Would you be dividing that space? No, probably not. It would just be open? Yeah, leave it open. And there's no space whatsoever in the house, nothing in the attic? Um, there is space in the attic, but it's like probably three feet, so mm -hmm. it's like a couple totes worth. And I gather from what I've read and what you've said, there's nothing in the basement anymore. That's now right. living yeah. space. Yeah, we have one closet right now that we're storing all the appliances while, okay. <laughs> while everything's being sanded. So. Okay. Um, is there anybody who either has Hi. any questions or wants to be heard in this? Yeah, I have one more question, Bonnie. Yeah, go ahead, Dave. Why not build a storage shed for the slumber? storage shed, uh, oh, I'd, shed. St I'd still like to have my truck and then the tenants vehicles um, under a roof and insulated well I, I guess what I'm saying is a smaller garage <clears throat> vehicles and uh, you know a storage uh, a, a shed for the lumber I'm just trying to optimize the space Okay, nothing further. And we, we do have a letter that's dated December 13th from Chris Corkery, who lives at 92 Beach Street. I'm going to read it. I'm writing this because I and my attorney, Nicholas Corkery, can't attend this meeting regarding 83 Beach Street project. My attorney was going to write a response letter, but has COVID. My concerns, this building isn't zoned for a 1,200 square foot structure. 925 max, I think, is correct. There is already a huge water problem because we live in a flood zone, which we can't afford any extra runoff. I'm a commercial realtor who owns many buildings, and this sounds like it's going to be used that way one or another. The size of the doors and how many will show a lot. Is this property going to be resold after all the property updates? There are many more concerns I wish to have. My attorney address when his health is better. I respectively ask to have him look at the plans for this project when he would be allowed. Thanks, Chris Corkery. Uh, 92 Beach Street also has the name of uh, attorney Nicholas Corkery of 868 Turnpike Street in uh, Canton. Um, I spoke with um, Scott Shippey, the building commissioner today, and he's not concerned about the garage doors. They're the same size of any garage doors. There's not, not, nothing excess in the, way of, um, in the way of size. So does anybody have any other questions? I guess the big question I have is why do you need this much space? Yeah, no, I'm just trying to optimize the space. Like, I, I didn't even realize the 625 was the max um, until, obviously, we went through the um, process, and they said we got to go through the Board of Appeal, but that's just, you know, what we came up with for rough size of the lot that we have, mm -hmm. figured all of the um, setbacks work, let's make the biggest garage we can. You know? Okay. So, unless anybody has any other questions? I do not. Dave, any other questions? Um, uh, no. Motion to close the public portion? I move we close the public portion of the meeting. Oh, sorry. 
Uh, we're going to do a roll call vote. So, uh, Dave. Sorry. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Whoa. Yes, go ahead. Sorry, I'm not sure how to flag anybody down. Can you tell us who you are? I'm uh, Joseph Bowler. I'm an abutter at uh, 17 Hayden. You know, I, I'm having trouble yeah, hearing this is it. Hard yeah. to hear. 17 Hayden. 17 Hayden. And, uh, Joseph Bowler, I'm an abutter at 17 Hayden Drive. Can you try upping the volume? <laughs> I, I, I have. I, I actually, I could hear the other gentleman perfectly clear. I think okay. in the room there might be a volume issue. Now, now we can hear you. Forward. So who are you and where are you from? Sure. Joseph Bollier. I'm the abutter at 17 Hayden Drive. So we're just to the Hayden. back mm -hmm. uh, of the property. Uh, go ahead. Okay. Um, so we got a, a bit of concern, I think, has been voiced by a few folks regarding uh, the nature of the use uh, for the proposed structure, concern over the size, and uh, um, the applicant's, uh, you know, stated business, right, is really flipping house, uh, lots of wood, lots of furniture, lots of improvements, um, runs a, uh, what effectively amounts to a construction crew of, of contractors, right, that uh, may be on and off of the property, uh, working out of such a structure, and, um, you know, really following uh, approval of a structure of this size, is there anything that really prevents that use of all of a sudden us living in what amounts to a, uh, um, you know, a bit of a home flipping business really in our backyard, as opposed to, I think you said you flipped five houses in the last uh, little bit here. Uh, that's, that's a decent amount of volume, right? Not really a hobby. Um, and I guess there's just a bit of concern given the you know overall size and nature of kind of the neighborhood, right? It's not a uh, industrial neighborhood at all, and saws, woodworking equipment, trucks, etc., make uh, quite a bit of noise. And also have some concerns, and, and these are also from the neighbors to the side of me who unfortunately weren't able to uh, to make it as well, uh, the Camellos. But um, you know, there's also a good amount of land. Uh, on the far side of the garage structure that has also been cleared uh, straight to the property line. Um, I think actually every tree on the property has pretty much been taken down at this point. Uh, but, you know, our concern is that might be used to store additional, um, you know, construction equipment, et cetera, um, you know, based on the applicant's, uh, you, know, you know, business and the fact that, uh, you know, storing a large amount of wood and everything else on the property and you know, just, just a lot of concern over the intended use. Well, let me answer at least part of your concern. So when we, well, first of all, any garage that exceeds 625 square feet as far as its footprint requires a special permit from this board. Mm -hmm. And when we do approve requests of that nature, amongst the conditions that we impose are prohibitions as far as the garage being utilized for any business purpose. Uh, prohibitions against it being used for any uh, residential purpose. So right there, there's a condition imposed that would address, you know, your concern. Now, obviously, if somebody were to, notwithstanding those conditions, utilize the property, use a lot of the premises for some business purpose, and that came to the attention of a neighbor, you would have the opportunity to inform the building commissioner, who's the zoning enforcement officer, and he would then take um, enforcement action. So that there is a mechanism built in when we do render a decision in favor of a garage of this nature to, to address those concerns. Okay, so that's built in, but really on a after the fact basis, uh, so to speak, okay. That, well, not, I wouldn't understand. say it's after the fact because we have to issue a written decision and those conditions yeah. would be within the decision itself. Okay. Those are those are largely our concerns. I think I would echo also the flooding and making sure that the flood plan's been drawn up properly because uh, there's a lot of water coming off the hill there that could drive uh, you know quite a bit of uh, issue into some people's lawns if uh, uh, obviously the land's not graded out properly. But uh, I'm not sure if that falls in here as well. Mm -hmm. But that's okay. a good point that my neighbor at uh, 92 Beach uh, brought up there. Are you directly in back of this property? Uh, directly in back, yeah. Okay. So it, it, it uh, to the back, and I'm also to the uh, right as you're facing beach. We have a, uh, a throughway that's about uh, 10 or 15 feet wide running up the side of the property as well. Okay. 
All right, thank you. Um, I think we made the motion. I think we got the second. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Dave, this is the close of the public portion. Yes? No, oh, he muted himself. Yes. Okay, Kim? Yes. And the yes. Um, I just want to bring some things to the board's attention because I went back and looked at other garage decisions that we've rendered, at least during the last six years. Um, in 2020, we approved two. Uh, one was for longer, 960 square feet footprint. Odessa, 960 square foot uh, footprint. In 2019, Howe, an 868 square foot uh, uh, footprint. O'Keefe, 962 footprint. In 2018, Johnson 988, Yucatonas 1080. Um, we denied one in 2017 that was for 960 square feet. Part of that was because of the, the size, part of that was the materials that were being used. Um, we did approve one in 2016 on Main Street for Brooks at 1,500 square feet. And Dave, Kim, and I were the individuals voting on that. Um, however, that was a, almost a two-acre parcel of property. The garage was located fairly far back from the street, so it was fairly unobtrusive um, from the street, or would be unobtrusive from the street. I don't think the garage was ever built. Oh. Um, also, we've got a garage here that's being proposed with a 1,200 square foot footprint. The footprint of the existing house is 1,344, so we're only talking 124 foot difference. So my big concern right now is, is size. I would like it to be a little bit lower, but that, that's where I'm standing right now. So, Dave, comments, thoughts, like questions? That's a um, very large garage, particularly compared to the, the lot size as well as the size of the existing um, dwelling. So I would say that I would uh, tend to be opposed to it at this point. Kim? And I also would add, you know, and, and this comes to us with op opposition from uh, three abutters. I guess they're all direct abutters, but three three individuals opposed. That's all. Uh, Kim? Uh, I also think this is a little bit large. Just looking back at, you know, the numbers that we have approved, generally, you know, 960, 962, 800 something or other. Yes, there was the 1500, as you mentioned, from um, 16. But as you said, that was on two acres. So that, mm -hmm. that is a, a different scenario. Um, I am glad that um, the bathroom is not an issue. That certainly makes mm -hmm. this easier to take a, a look at. Um, and I understand what you're trying to do. I completely understand that. And, um, and when we're talking about any application that comes in front of us, we are looking at the particular application, but we're also looking at this as setting precedent and what sort of a message does this send to right. any future homeowner that you know comes before us. So we're sort of looking at it in two ways at the same time, just so you yep. understand. Um, this does seem very large. It seems a bit out of proportion with the residents. It almost gives the appearance of two houses on the lot. Right. Yeah. Um, Kurt? Uh, nothing further, just echoing Kim's point. It's a, it's a, it's a large structure uh, compared with the lot and the existing house. Ray? I agree with uh, all that information. You know, I think Dave's suggest idea of, you know, what about a storage, a separate um, 
you know, storage section, you know, in a, in a separate building as an option for keeping the wooden there, you know, would be a way to get the garage size down to the more standard size for that area. So we, we got two options, I think. Um, I mean, you heard where our concerns are. We can obviously turn this down. Yeah. Um, if everybody is inclined and you're inclined to come back with a proposal on a smaller structure, we would continue the matter to give you that opportunity. Okay. I, I think from my perspective, you know, again, looking at some of the other ones, you know, anything between 960 and, say, 990. 990, I think, would be 30 by 33. Yeah. Um, anything in that range, I think I would be more inclined to, to favor. Um, so that, those are the options. Okay. We can, we can say, if we say no, you're, 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 you're done for two years. Right. If you want, you know, time to Drop reconsider, see if you can come up with something. And, and from my perspective, if you come up with something that is in a 960 to 990, and again, notwithstanding the fact that we do have conditions that we impose, mm -hmm. it's more in keeping with what we've approved in the past. Makes sense. So, thoughts? I agree. I, I would still be concerned about the, um, the storage of the lumbar. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that we can probably address that, you know, through conditions. Yeah, okay. Well, we can, uh, you know, I certainly will listen to any proposal that he might have, but just uh, beware that I would be concerned about where this lump is going. Yeah, my... my I think the concern that I would have with the lumber is it gives the appearance of you're running a business from that location. I got you, yeah. So, and again, this is supposed to be a residential garage, not a commercial right. garage. Right. So. Diana, do you have the... Um, I do. I guess we need to take a vote to continue this, right? This is to extend the time within you must render a decision. Is that the right one? Yeah, what's the case number? You have it. Uh, 17? Yeah. Diana, what, what would be the January? Would January, January 19th. be an, uh, enough time for you, do you yep, think? that'll work. 19th? Yep, January 19th, 2023. And what would be the February date? February is 1, 2, 3, February 16th. So what I'd like you to do, if you could sign this, and this would, again, be to continue the matter to the January date. And then we would extend to February, the February date, the day in which we have to reach a decision. Okay. okay. We have a motion to continue to January 19th. I move that we continue the application until January 19th. Dave? Second. Okay. Um, Kim? Yes. Dave? Yes. And me, yes. So we'll see you on the 19th. And, and again, um, because you're going to be showing, ideally, a smaller garage, we'll need a certified plot plan you know, to show that as well, okay? Yep. As well as whatever, you know, other uh, plans you're going to come up with to, to show the construction of the garage itself. Right. Okay? Yep. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Barney, can you mention that no, um, another notice won't go out? Yep. Okay, so just no January 9th. Yeah. yeah. For the neighbor guy that was on Zoom, too. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. DiNapoli? Good evening. How are you? So you want to screen in your porch? Yes. Why don't you talk to us a little bit about that? Okay. Basically, we have a, um, a deck on the back of our home at Fort Carey Lane. I don't know if you have the pictures, but uh, 
Mm -hmm. We wanted to add a, simply a, not an all season room, just a three season screened in porch, aluminum, all aluminum to match the existing white of the house. As part of our uh, HOA uh, covenants, we have to, uh, me as trustee for the association, has to have the votes of 10 people. We did receive those votes. We received 13 positive, none opposed. And the next step was to come before the ZBA with the proposal. I've uh, also submitted, I don't know what Diane, I don't know what you gave them, but I also submitted a plan mm -hmm. of the, uh, the design and can answer any other questions you may have. So just to bring it to the board's attention, um, sections K1 and M2 of the comprehensive permit decision that we issued in 2015 prohibit any alteration, reconstruction, extension, or change to any residential unit that's constructed under authority of that permit unless authorized by the ZBA pursuant to the provisions of 760 CMR 56.0511. At our meeting on December 16, 2021, we approved amendments to the Wyman Village um, covenants that provided a protocol for changes to the exterior of residential units. That would include any solar panels that a resident wanted to put on Correct. his or her house, any um, enclosure of the decks, right. and any other um, exterior alterations. Um, those protocols required, as Mr. DiNapoli indicated, um, first approval by the trustees, Correct. and then to come to us um, for approval in accordance with the um, the, the state regulations relative to comp comprehensive permits. And what we need to determine is whether the changes that are being proposed are substantial or insubstantial. And as you may recall, we've done that in the past relative to, um, to fencing at the, um, the Highland, Highland Ridge development. This is the first time anybody's come you know, before us relative to um, screening in a deck. But we've um, determined Again, in other matters that um, uh, changes that have been proposed are, are insubstantial. So we had the same issue to decide you know, today whether the change that's being requested is substantial or insubstantial. If we determine that it's substantial, we have to have a public hearing on the matter. Okay. If we determine that it's insubstantial, we'll just write up a short decision and you would be free to then proceed with the, um, the building commissioner. Okay. So any questions that anybody has? Yeah. I don't have any. Dave, any questions? Yeah, how many, how many units are there at the Wyman Village? 20. 20. So I think in theory, um, you know, many other uh, homeowners could also request the same um, sort of modification and I wonder how that would look I, I really think this is a substantial um, change request so we can hear what the abutters have to say there are quite a few abutters if I remember right about this sort of uh, development or change let, actually yes. let me ask Mr. DiNapoli a question not, not every home in that development has a deck, correct? Uh, everyone has a deck. Some are above ground, some are on ground. Okay. Y yours, again, is above ground. Mine is above ground. Okay. Um, the majority are above ground. The majority above ground? Okay. Dave, do you want to say anything further? Or? No, I, I just think, uh, you know, the public should have a chance to be heard on it. Mm -hmm. I'm not so sure how I would feel about it if I was in a butter. Uh, you know, one is one thing, but you know, many of them is going to change the whole appearance of the uh, place. And I don't know if it's for the better or not, but uh, it definitely will change what it looks like back there. And you know, people who uh, judge a, a lot of, of you know, how they feel about uh, property next to them by what it looks like. Can I, can I respond to that? Yeah, of course. Yes. 
Um, as I mentioned before, 13 people voted in favor. All 20 residents got a copy of the proposal, including the plans you see mm -hmm. that were submitted. There were three abutters immediately around my property. Mm -hmm. All those three voted in favor. The only people that can see my unit voted in favor. So, every, I, you know, if you talk about bringing it in front of the, the group, I'm sure they would vote in favor of it once again. But I, that's just speculation. Mm -hmm. Why did the abutters get the vote on this? It's a requirement of the procedure that, that Mr. Ovitt mentioned that was approved last uh, December. It required, I'm the trustee for the complex. The, um, the trustee needed to get 10 positive votes in order to move forward. Another resident can do that without getting the 10 positive votes. Another resident would have to get my approval and then it would come to the ZBA. Dave, the... Um Protocols that were put in place a year ago um, amended both the covenants and the declaration of trust, and they're almost identical, yeah. the provisions. And, and again, what they require was, or what they do require is that there be a favorable vote of the trustees and then yeah. a favorable vote you know, from the uh, ZBA. Um, and as Mr. DiNapoli indicated, all the trustees have been contacted. All of the all the residents have been contacted, That's correct, and they've received the requisite number of votes to authorize him really to, to do what he wants. But he has to go to us first, you know, be, before he can actually construct anything. So he's followed the protocol in accordance with the requisite documents of the uh, Wyman Village uh, Condominium Association or Homeowners Association, I guess it would be Homeowners Trust. <laughs> All right. Well, you know, I, I'm not trying to belabor it. I'm just, you know, just thinking about, uh, you know, here's one. What if there's more and more, and, and then how, to, how does it look down the road? More and more of the same kind of approval. I mean, technically, technically they can. if one of his neighbors wants to do the same thing, it would be before us if the trustees would be voting in favor of it. Exactly. So each individual homeowner who was requesting to either put a solar panel up or to enclose a deck or a patio would need to obtain the approval internally and then come before us to determine whether that request is substantial or insubstantial. Yeah. Well, like I say, I, I don't want to stand in the way of it. Uh, so if that's the uh, will of the other two, I'm, I'm on board. Okay. Kim, any questions? No. Lorraine? No. No. So I guess the motion would be, from my perspective, um, I, I view this as insubstantial. The change that's being requested is insubstantial. So I think the um, motion would be to um, make a determination that, the, that Mr. DiNapoli's request is ins insubstantial. And if we vote in favor of that, then he would need to uh, to follow through with the building commissioner. Sure. You have to close the hearing. No, it's not a hearing. It's not a public hearing. It's not, I'm sorry. So I move to uh, make the determination that the request is insubstantial. Dave, do you want to second that? I'd rather you do it. I'm sorry. I'd rather you do it. Okay. I'll I'll second that motion. Okay, all in favor? I got to do a roll call. Um, Kim? Yes. Uh, Barney? Yes. Dave? Yes. Okay. So what I'm going to do, and I'll probably do it tomorrow, is draft a short decision. Okay. Um, we'll sign it. Uh, you'll have to file in the Registry of Deeds because you're modifying the uh, comprehensive permit. Okay. Um, we should be able to get that to you sometime. I would think within the next uh, week, certainly before Christmas. Okay. Okay? Perfect. Thank Great. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Do we want to take a few minutes break or what? You can do the minutes. Minutes. I'm sorry. Um, anybody have any questions on minutes from November 17? Mm -hmm. No, they look good. Okay. A motion? I move we accept the minutes. Second. Second. Okay. Um, Kim? Yes. Dave? Yes. Kurt? Yes. Lorraine? Yes. And me, yes. 
Okay, do we want to take a few minutes? Yep. Yes. Great. Okay, why don't we take um, five minutes and then we'll start the next matter. This isn't on. We have the continued public hearing, 119 Moore Street Realty Trust. Request a comprehensive permit under the local initiative program pursuant to Mass General Laws Chapter 40B, Sections 20-23 to construct 52 condominium residential units, 25% of which will be affordable to households earning not more than 80% of the area median income. Property situated at 119 Moore Street in the General Industrial District and is in the future aquifer area overlay district. Um, in addition to Kurt, Kim, Lorraine, and me here in town hall, Dave is on Zoom. Paige, are you there? Ooh. She's there. That's her? No, that's him. But Paige is there. Paige is there. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, Judy Barrett, are you there? Uh, yes, I'm here, Barney. Okay, thank you. And Dylan O'Donnell, are you there? Yep, I'm here. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And I see that Matt Brennan is with us in Town Hall, the uh, town's health director. Um, an update since the October 20 hearing session. Uh, receipt of additional materials, all of which are on the town website. Uh, an August 25, 2022 memorandum and related documentation from Gilvin Associates responding to Environmental Partners July 25, 2022 traffic report comments. An October 25, 2022 email from Bill Casbara concerning environmental testing of the 119 Moore Street site. An October 31, 2022 email from Janet Sergeant Tracy concerning the testing issue. An undated letter from Kathy and Carl Vandenboom concerning the testing issue, and that letter was sent by email on November 3rd, 2022. November 15, 2022 memorandum from Carl and Kathy Vandenboom to this board and to the Board of Selectmen expressing numerous matters concerning the application. A November 16, 2022 letter from Environmental Partners containing a list of recommended conditions and mitigation measures associated with this matter. A November 18, 2022 inspection log from Matthew Brennan, the Town of Foxborough Director of Public Health. A November 28, 2002 memorandum prepared by Paige Duncan setting forth the conditions and mitigation measures that the planning board typically imposes with respect to subdivision proposals, approvals, a revised list of requested waivers that was forwarded by email from Bill Casbara on December 5, 2022, a December 13, 2022 letter from Nangle Consulting concerning the environmental testing results. And I will comment briefly on some of those um, communications. But what I would like right now would be a motion to enter each of these items into the record and waive their reading. I move that we enter these into the record and yet waive the reading. Dave, will you second, second that? Yes. Okay. Uh, Kim? Yes. Dave? Yes. And Barney? Yet. Yes. So some comments concerning these communications. Um, the Gillen Associates August 25th memorandum was received in late August and should have been added to the website and then entered into the record at our September 29th hearing. The fact that it was not was due to an oversight for which I take full responsibility. Um, environmental partners did respond to the memorandum by letter dated September 20, 2022, and that letter was placed on the website and entered into the record at the September 29th hearing. I have three brief comments concerning the November 15th letter from the Vandebooms, 
And these comments are mine. They do not in any manner speak for the Board of Selectmen. I don't have authority to, uh, to do that. First, your request that the applicant be required to, quote, provide a complete application refers to the application that was requesting a project eligibility letter, and that application was submitted to the Department of Housing and Community Development. It's not our application. Our requirements for a complete application were satisfied, and that's the reason we have conducted a hearing for the past six months. If you have an issue with the application that was submitted to DHCD, you need to address it with them. It's not our concern, and it's not our issue. Second, the board has fully complied with the requirements of Chapter 40B, Section 21. We're required by regulation to inform other town boards, committees, departments, and officials of a comprehensive permit application within seven days of the date on which it has been filed and to request their participation in this matter. The application was filed on June 10. We complied with our, our obligation on June 13. Diana subsequently contacted those who did not timely respond. The various communications from town boards, committees, departments, and officials that have been entered into the record did not appear on their own. They were in response to our communication. Third, each of us has read this letter. As we proceed to deliberate on the application, we will accord your comments and questions the consideration that we believe to be warranted. The November 16 letter from environmental partners that sets forth recommended conditions and mitigation measures was suggested by Judy Barrett and sub subsequently requested by me. I requested Paige Duncan's memorandum concerning conditions that the planning board typically imposes for subdivision matters. These requests and the conditions and mitigation measures that have been recommended in response should not be taken to mean that this board has decided to approve the comprehensive permit. No such determination has been made and no determination whether to approve or deny the permit will be made until we have the opportunity to discuss that issue. That will occur in an open meeting. The conditions and mitigation member measures in these two documents provide context to the proposed development. It's information that will best allow each of us to decide whether the application can be approved or should be denied. We may individually and collectively determine that these and additional conditions and mitigation measures do not satisfy us that the requested comprehensive per permit would result in a healthy, safe, and desirable residential location. Conversely, such conditions, whether accepted by us in whole or in part, and whether modified after receiving public comments prior to the close of the hearing, may provide the assurances that we need in order to approve the permit. And finally, though we have entered the revised list of waivers into the record, that also does not mean that those exemptions from local regulations have been accepted by this board. We will consider the requested waivers as part of our deliberation concerning the application. We've received three invoices from environmental par partners that we need to approve. Uh, one invoice was for the period July 30 to August 26 in the amount of $2,403.75. Second was um, for the period of August 27 to September 30 in the amount of $6,290.25. And the third was for the period October 1 to October 28 in the amount of $1,357.50. What I need is a motion to approve the payment for the amounts that set forth in those invoices. I move to approve uh, said amounts. Dave, second it? Second. Second. Uh, Kim? Yes. Dave? Dave? Yes. And Barney, yes. Uh, also want to acknowledge the receipt of an additional payment by the applicant in the amount of $5,000 into the escrow <clears throat> account. 
Uh, thank you very much. I'm hoping that that amount plus what is already in the, uh, the account will be hopefully more than we need as we proceed. What I want to spend most of tonight on is the testing results, testing report, and I guess I would pass things over to you, correct? Correct. <clears throat> it would be easy for you to be over there. Whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, I'm just thinking of, you know, facing the public because of sure. any questions you might receive. Whatever is easy for you. This is fine. There's not a lot of people here. Um, uh, we, so we went out and did put some test warnings and monitoring wells in. Um, I, you, you may recall as part of our phase one, we had done some preliminary assessment around the garage. We had put in test pits. Uh, so when we went out there, we were focusing on the concerns about offsite issues uh, and migration of, of contaminants on the property. We, we went out and put, uh, we got four borings in. We completed two of those as wells. Hang and on. The mic closer. You need to speak into Sorry. the mic. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we put in four borings. We completed two of those as wells, as well up here in the corner of the property, and there's a well down here in the lower uh, left-hand corner of the site. Uh, very difficult drilling conditions out there. Um, we kind of were focusing on trying to get a read on these offsite, the known offsite release conditions, which are up here, and then this site over here. Um, we uh, we didn't see any indications of fill in the borings we put in. Uh, we screened in the field for total vault organic compounds. We didn't detect any significant. We get trace levels, but we typically do. Um, we uh, when we went back, we so soils, we collected soil samples and screened for metals, petroleum hydrocarbons, and VOCs at different locations. The we looked at VOCs, the soil water, soil groundwater interface up at NC1 and NC3. We were looking for things migrating onto the property. Uh, and then we uh, looked at a uh, number of them for, for metals and petroleum hydrocarbons. Soil analysis, we got um, no VOCs in soils, we, which is consistent with our field data and what we were observing. Uh, metals, we got uh, trace levels of, of metals, uh, all well below the applicable standards. And um, we got trace levels of petroleum hydrocarbons at, at one location, but again, orders of magnitude below the applicable standards. Uh, so then we sampled groundwater at these two wells, NC1 and NC4. And uh, we sampled for, for VOCs, petroleum hydrocarbons, and uh, dissolved metals. We detected uh, trace levels of, of metals and uh, trace levels of acetone in, in both wells, uh, all well below the applicable standard. So we didn't find anything that triggered any release notification thresholds. We compared them to the most conservative soil and groundwater standards for residential or for drinking water, and we didn't exceed any of those thresholds. So uh, based on that, we concluded that there was no need to report, and we didn't think there was need for any further assessment. Again, we had done, our focus when we looked at this property was the garage, because there was an oil tank back there. We did ground penetrating radar. We did an electromagnetic survey. We, then we came and put test pits around there. There was also a floor drain in the garage. We went in the garage. We drove a sample into the floor drain and we submitted samples for lab analysis. None of that. We had no issues with that. Didn't exceed any of the reportable standards. So that's essentially what we found. Can I ask one, one question? You said the drilling conditions were difficult. Yep. Why, why were they difficult? So, so it's all till out there. Um, you get down to about five feet and you get into uh, a, a lot of stone and cobbles. And sometimes you can drive through that stuff uh, and sometimes you can't. Um, uh, we, we, we drove pretty hard and couldn't get, uh, so we had to get down to be able to put a well in. Um, we, we just couldn't, we were, uh, we were damaging equipment trying to drive it down. So we actually, in the middle of the day, we, uh, so, so now when you have a problem like that, you got to sort of prioritize your resources because we're trying to get as much data as we can. Uh, in the middle of the day, we shifted drilling approaches. We actually had them go get different equipment and we switched and we argued through and, and that was actually, up at NC1, we couldn't drive a well in, but we were able to auger down. Uh, down at NC4, we couldn't auger through. So it's kind of a hit or miss thing. Uh, it's actually a different drilling technique. We would go out there if we had to do more out there, a little more aggressive and a bigger piece of equipment. You know, we're also going through the woods. It's hard to sort of 
we, we, we were trying to find the right piece of equipment to do this. Um, but so, so that was, it was, uh, it, it's basically till. It's tough, tough to drill through. And, and, it, and you can get, you can, with a geoprobe, you can get through that, but you've got to sit on it for a long time. And now you're eating into your day and you're starting to damage equipment. Some, we actually, one sample, I think at NC2, uh, we, we actually couldn't get the sample out of the two because it was we had been pounding so hard. Mm. So, but we found that everywhere. And the thing is, is um, all the, uh, they someone dug a bunch of test pits out here. You can see them all over the place, and, and you, you see that you see that the cobbles and the, the stone in, in every one of those test pits. So it's pervasive throughout the whole property. Thank you. Why did you choose those locations as opposed to others? So. <clears throat> We, uh, you know, initially we had, we did have a sort of a broader scope, but you know we could only get so much done in a day. So those locations, I know there were concerns about a plume of something moving onto the property. There's also quite a bit of debris over here that's on the town's property, uh, and then you know this is the uh, the pits back here people are concerned about, and and this is a listed disposal site. This is Summit Castings, which has got petroleum release there. Plus it's a casting site, so that's why we so we, we focused on those because this has given us a read of what's coming through. Um, if there was a massive plume of VOCs coming through, we would have detected in soil and groundwater there. Um, and uh, we did do some surficial sampling for metals because of the foundry. And I know when EPA was doing their research or their their assessment in this, they found some elevated levels of metals and they screened that whole area. So. Uh, but but that was the focus. We also, because we had done work in here, we were pretty comfortable. I think we had four test pits around the garage. And then, again, there are test pits uh, at various locations in the property. Um, you know, we were trying to prioritize addressing those off-site concerns uh, beca because, uh, you know, that is the, uh, again, historically, we didn't see anything other than, you know, we in our phase one report, we identified there were, we saw solid waste at various locations and remnants of the former farm. It was a, a agriculture. Uh, the owner had some some agriculture going on over there, so there were structures and things like that. Uh, but th that was why we focused on those on those areas. Okay. Uh, no, I did have a question, but I, it's gone. We got it. Hopefully, it comes back. Answer. Yes, that's probably it. Uh, Lorraine, any questions? Uh, not right now, thank you. Anything else? No. Dave, any questions? No. Um, Paige and Judy, any questions? Not at this time, thank you. No, I don't have any, thank you. Okay. I'm gonna allow the public to ask questions, but not, we're not there yet. Um, Molly, uh, Cody was not able to join us, but she did send an email. Do you have a copy of that? I do. Okay, she did send an email um, this afternoon. And what I'd like is for one of my colleagues to uh, to read it, and then we'll take a motion to enter it into the record. You want to do it? I can read it, okay. yes, I can. Okay. Do, do you have copies back there? Do we make any others? I have a, I have a few. Okay. Okay, so this was from Molly Cody, uh, dated uh, today. She's ended this afternoon. Good afternoon. I have conducted a cursory review of the subsurface assessment program document prepared by Nangle Consulting Associates, Inc., regarding 119 Morse, the Moore Street property. In short, they advanced four soil borings, completed two as two-inch groundwater monitoring wells, witnessed by the Foxborough Director of Public Health. Field screening of soil samples was conducted at the time the borings were advanced. Fairly shallow refusal was encountered. The total depths of the borings ranged from 5 to 15 feet. Trace levels, 0.1 to 0.3 parts per million by volume of volatile organic compounds, VOCs, were detected in the soil samples. The field work and sampling methods were consistent with standard practice for this type of investigation. Five soil samples from various steps in the borings were submitted for laboratory analysis as follows. And then it has locations, um, you know, NC1, S1, and S2. The depth was zero to five feet. 
and the analysis was for MCP 14 metals, NC-1, S5, depth of 8 to 10 feet, analysis for VOCs, EPH with target PAHs, NC-2, S1, depth of 0 to 2.5, analysis MCP 14 metals, NC-3, S3, depths 5 to 6 feet, analysis for VOCs, NC4, S1, depths of 0 to 2 feet, analysis for MCP-14 metals, NC4, S3, depth 4 to 6 feet, analysis for VOCs, EPH, with target PAHs. Two groundwater samples were collected and submitted for laboratory analysis as follows. NC1, VOCs, and dissolved MCP-14 metals. NC4, VOCs and dissolved MCP-14 metals, extract, extractable petroleum hydrocarbons, EPH, with targets polycyclic, oh boy, aromatic hydrocarbon, PAH carbons. Laboratory results were compared to the reportable concentrations for soil in a residential setting, RCS1, and groundwater concentrations applicable to drinking water, GW1. Soil. Two EPH constituents were detected in a sample collected from the boring identified as NC4 at the depth of 4 to 6 feet. Metals were detected in the samples analyzed for MCP14 metals. None of the detections listed above were in exceedance of the applicable reportable concentrations. Groundwater. Barium was the only metal detected in two groundwater samples analyzed for metals. EPH constituents were not detected. Acetone was the only VOC detected below the applicable reportable concentration. Based on this very preliminary review, a condition requiring reporting to mass DEP was not identified. Limitations, suggestions. This was a very limited assessment, particularly for a six acre property. Soil conditions can vary greatly from one boring location to another on a property. One recommendation would be to ask that they retain an environmental professional to perform visual observations of the soil and screen for VOCs during the excavation of the proposed building foundations slash slabs. If any obvious staining, odors, or elevated PID readings are observed, it would be prudent for them to submit soil samples for analysis. Please let me know if you have any questions. If questions arise during their hearing, I can try to answer them tomorrow. Molly. So, thank you. Um, a motion to enter that into the record, this email to the record. I move we enter Molly's email into the record. Dave, second it. Second. Kim? Yes. Dave? Yes. And Barney, yes. Um, I did speak with Molly this afternoon. Um, and again, she was unable to. Um, to, to come tonight, that she did indicate that if we had any questions for her, that we would, you know, just pass them on. Um, the one question that I have for her, I can probably ask ask you. Knowing what is at the Summit Casting location, mm -hmm. um, if you had, what, what would you have expected um, as far as contaminants to be on this property if, if they had been on, if you had found them on this property? From the summit casting site? Yeah. It, you know, so metals and petroleum, hydrocarbons, they also had some low levels of chlorinated solvents on that on that site. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't really expect to find them because I think we're upgrading of, of, of those locations. But uh, but you never know because, you know, you could have atmospheric deposition of metals. Sometimes you get that. Um, you, you know, that those are those are the contaminants on that site is metals, petroleum, hydrocarbons, which are number six oil. That doesn't really move. Uh, you know, there's a hydraulic condition inside, but that's not going to move in those soils very far. And, and again, VOCs, they have low levels of VOCs. Mm -hmm. Okay. Matt, are you uh, ready to answer some questions? Sure, absolutely. Would you like me to come up? Yeah, actually, probably over here. Or you can sit there. The other end. So Matt Brennan is the town's Director of Health, and he volunteered to be on site um, at the testing, was there at least for the first day you were there. 
Um, well, we were only there one day. Well, right, you weren't there when we were sampling the wells, I guess. So I've, I've had some conversations with Matt, and I'd like to not just ask him questions relative to the information before us now, but I really want to go back to one of the questions that you and I had uh, discussed previously. And let me just preface it by saying Matt is not a licensed site professional, but my understanding is you've previously worked for a, math, uh, for a licensed site professional, and you've been in the field, you've done pr pretty much everything that an LSP would do, except certify a report. Correct. So um, before I was in public health, I was a geologist, um, and I would follow the drill rakes, and I would be in the field taking environmental samples, including groundwater, soils, and submitting them um, just like the LSP would. Um, so I have a rough idea of, you know, what they'd be looking for and the contaminants and what to look for in the field uh, if you were going to find contamination there. So I was certainly satisfied that um, Matt would be on site at the time of testing and um, I'm very satisfied that he's here tonight to answer a couple of questions. But one of the things, Matt, that you and I have talked about was that even if there were a need to report that there were contaminants to DEP, that remediation measures often would be, would be acceptable. And I wonder if you just give us a little insight to the types of remediation measures that one might utilize. Correct. So, uh, you know, if you own a contaminated piece of property, it doesn't mean that there's nothing that you can do with it. The MCP is a set of standards that you would have to uh, meet in order to build there. So um, we have other properties in town that, um, you know, are polluted. However, with certain excavations, with um, uh, subsurface sort of uh, systems uh, to, to take away the vapor and vapor systems, you're allowed to, um, you know, build or, or do something on that property. Now, this property is nothing like that. The, you know, the soils are there. Um, they showed no signs of visual contamination, odor, or smells, so the, it wouldn't be appropriate um, for this site. But, um, you know, as long as they're compliant with the MCP, there's no, um, you know, th there would be no issues in, with building there. So based on the results that it came back, um, you don't see any, any hazard, any health hazard to? No, no. So, I mean, the soil and the groundwater, both standards came back below residential standards, which means no further work would have to be done in order to meet those standards. Um, you know, unless something came up, uh, during excavation, during where there was something found that's unknown that could change things. But with the information that they have provided, it appears to be clean. So Molly's recommendation of, um, of asking that they retain an environmental pro professional to perform visual observations of the soil and screen for VOCs during the excavation of the proposed building foundation slabs um, when I spoke with her today, she was suggesting that as a condition if we were to, um, uh, to approve the uh, permit. Would you say that would be a reasonable and prudent uh, measure? Absolutely. Just when someone, um, if, if they, someone would be notified when they're going to build foundations, things like that, clear the earth in order to take a look at the soils. Um, and again, look for spots that may have been missed. Um, you know, you may be able to f find something that, you know, you wouldn't come to light um, during their, uh, what we did on the, or what they did on the site. Okay. Uh, questions? Kim? Uh, do, how did you, um, what is your thought about the, the placement of the testing sites? So, um, I thought it was, it was spelled out in the report very nicely. Um, you know, it wasn't a complete look at the property. It was looking for contamination um, off-site that may have come onto the property. So um, the borings were set in a manner that would uh, be on the property line. That way, if there was um, something coming onto the property, leaching onto the property, <clears throat> that they would be aware of. 
Um, but obviously, if you wanted to get a, um, you know, a whole look, and, and I'm not privy to all the data, I'm just, I'm just going by the borings. I didn't see the test pits or anything else, so um, if there was more data, I, you know, I, that may change my mind. But from what I see, um, it's limited. Anything further? No, thank you. Uh, Lorraine, any questions? No, thank you. Her? No. David, any questions? No, but I would just like to comment that I, I appreciate the um, the uh, put another set of eyes on this and the assistance of the Board of Health. You're welcome. <laughs> Don't go away. Maybe, maybe Paige and Judy have questions. Okay. Uh, Paige, Judy, any questions? None yes, no. here. No, thank you, Barney. Okay, Matt, thank you very much. Um, before I open to the public for questions, anything else for Mr. Parker? No. Not at this moment, thank you. No. Go ahead. Would it be easier again? Are you going to direct this to Mr. Parker? or? And I can come to the podium and... Yeah. and yeah. <clears throat> Uh, good evening, Drew Hoyt, um, Nine, We Met Lane. Um, first, I want to thank the applicant and the board. I know I, I was the one who was beating the drum most heavily on this issue. Um, and, you know, until this sampling was done, it was a complete unknown and a, a real concern. I think these sampling uh, results you know, are obviously very reassuring, hopefully. I mean, they, I know they are to me and presumably to the board as well and future residents. And so I appreciate, I appreciate that, um, you know, that what wasn't originally intended to be done was, was done. So thank you for that. Um, a, quest a question I had just as I was going through the report, it's one thing that was um, noted by the lab was that the one of the samples, the, the deep sample at um, NC1, NC1S5, took a couple of extra days to get to the lab. Can you just explain that? Sure. <coughs> it was actually one sample. Uh, one sample was, uh, it was just left in the first, so lab comes and picks up from our office and the person uh, handing them off didn't uh, left a sample in the fridge. So when the lab got it, they go through uh, they go through the chain and they see and it didn't match what they brought in. So we sent it under another chain of custody. I think there's two chain of custodies. I think we sent it in. It went in the next day or something. I think still within whole time. It was all the analysis was whole time was kept in the fridge. Right. I mean, as you can imagine, I went I went through it trying to find <laughs> any reason to find fault with it, and that's, that's what I came up with. So, um, and you've explained it. So, but um, the the other thing reading your report in conjunction with um, Mr. Brennan's report. Mr. Brennan, I didn't know you were here in Foxborough now. I remember dealing with you in Weymouth. I don't even remember me, but <laughs> glad that you're here. Um, the, the waste on town property that's very close to the border of the development property just, it just doesn't seem to me that we should be talking about this development as as being a you know a, a gateway to great conservation land where children should go frolic and play when in fact you know they're going to walk 10 feet off the property line and you know go slice their hand open on a barrel or or fall into a fall into a well or you know there there are hazards there um, real hazards not necessarily you know, contamination type hazards, but physical hazards to, to the young children that, that would be running around back there. I just think it's a terrible idea to, um, and I know in the project presentation, this was talked about, you know, we're gonna have paths, they're gonna go out into the woods and play and enjoy nature, and et cetera. It's just not, that's just not what it is in that area by, by NC1. It's a hazardous area. Um, the town, I mean, obviously, the, the town ought to go 
take care of it. Um, but assuming that's not going to happen anytime soon because <coughs> it hasn't happened yet, we should be doing the opposite of encouraging children to go play back there. We should be preventing them from going back there. There should be a fence there, like a, sto a permanent stockade fence around the parts of the property that are near hazardous off-site conditions. And I would, uh, certainly that applies to the, you know, locations where the hazards are like right over the property line. And if you've, if you've walked around there, you've, you've seen it. I mean, these are, it's described as, as I don't remember what the word was used, uh, you know, junk or, or waste that's on the surface. The, the reports in the DEP file characterize, characterize that stuff quite differently as waste and bar you know, barrel and drum dumping grounds and you know, certainly not anything we want children around. So I would hope that you know, now that we've addressed the environmental you know, hazard, you know, contamination type concern that we would give a little more close attention to that issue of physical hazards and prevent people from getting back there. And I would also go so far as to say we, we don't really want to be encouraging people to be uh, back on the Porter Estate either, where you know, 10 or 15, 20 years ago they put up some fencing. That's long since been torn down. It's, it's not a safe place. The conservation land is not a safe place for people to be. Uh, we should not be encouraging them to be there. Um, and I did actually have one more question about the contamination um, sampling results. At NC4, mm -hmm. um, the, the levels are, are described as, as being trace levels, but, it, but at NC4, the, the lead contamination uh, concentration, or no, I'm sorry, it's the arsenic, looking at your, the report tables. I think the arsenic concentration reported at NC4 was more than half of the re reportable concentration. You know, you go 10 feet one way or the other, you, m you might be into a reportable concentration. And I'm, so I, but I have a question about that. Is, is that a part of the site where there is going to be fill? Or is what's currently the surface soil at NC4 what's going to remain the surface soil? If it's going to remain the surface soil, I would not necessarily be resting on a contamination concentration that's half of the reportable for arsenic and, you know, um, but if there's going to be fill there on top of what's currently there, that would maybe be a different story. I don't have that answer. Mr. Buckley, sorry. Would you be able to Mark, speak, speak and get us an answer to that? I, I do think the, don't the buildings go right up yeah. I think they do. They do. This is obviously yeah. going to be some setback. And give me a minute. And uh, with yeah, respect to the reportable yeah. concentration, we, we do a lot of sampling at municipal parks and things like that. You, you find arsenic everywhere. Uh, you know, the big number is 20 or 40 for an imminent hazard, right? That's, that's what we look at. But it, it's everywhere. It's pretty ubiquitous. Uh, a, a lot of, uh, you know, uh, fumigants and a lot, a lot of things we use, lead arsenate for vegetation control, that, that stuff put that, that stuff everywhere. So, so we, we see it quite a bit. Be, be that as it may, it's, it's next to the summit casting site and it's, and it's in the one place you sampled, it's half of the reportable, so it's, it's, I don't rest easy knowing, you know, on the fact that there might be hazardous conditions here I'm and fine. a bunch of other places. But the point is, I guess, you know, the question I would just maybe leave hanging out there until, until you can figure out the answer is whether there is going to be fill on what top of this or, or not. And if not, I would suggest the board might want to maybe suggest a little more sampling around NC4 because that seems to be where the, the surface metals were, you know, not above reportables in that one location, but at least for arsenic, it was, at, you know, north of 50% of it, so. It looks right behind buildings one and two. <coughs> uh, isn't that where they were going to bring in fill? That's what I thought. I think so, but was it very close to the building? Would, would the fill be very close to the building? Because Barney here, apologies, you're not going to see this. I'll have an Back answer. there. 
so it looks water's pretty shallow there, so I would imagine maybe they are going to have to bring that up. Here? Yeah. But how yeah, I'll, I'll get a, a specific answer in a minute. You will. Okay, he's he's working on that. Great. Thank okay, thank you. And lastly, I would I would echo the suggestion that um, there be further, yeah, that there be an environmental professional during excavation and construction to, mm -hmm. as was already suggested. Yep. So again, and thank, as, as thank you, the, that's all I have. As, as far as the fencing suggestion, I mean, that's something we would consider um, as far as a condition if we get to that point. So thank, thank you. you. Okay. Anybody else? Anything further from you, Mr. Parker? Not unless you have any questions. Do you have any questions no, about uh, us? Where? Joan, you? Been to a party today, so I'm coming with bells on, not the old back there. Uh, Joan Gallivan, um, 9 Cannon Forge Drive in Foxborough. <clears throat> um, I don't understand a lot of this part of this, and I hope you can. Um, a lot of that, uh, all that technical information, I think it's good that they've done that. You have the information and so forth. But to me, um, part of what you're looking at is health and safety. That's part of what that was, um, to do that extra work and to supposedly um, get some reassurances, but I still, you know, the normal person that lives in town here always has this problem of saying we've got the dump there and we did it for millions of thousands of years or whatever it was, and we still have the pits and so forth. But anyway, getting to the um, health and safety issue, it just doesn't seem like it's the right place to put this um, development, the size of it and the, and the intensity of it. Um, where it's located in this town is far away from everything. It's not in the character of, of the residential area that's there. I mean, the access is, is really dangerous now. So we've got these um, 46 now, supposedly, units. And I think there are three and four, two, two and three bedroom units. So, um, you know, originally it was brought to us as a affordable housing, we can help affordable housing. We certainly don't need that anymore. We have 200 to 250 affordable housing units going up in Walnut Street there. But, but just for the look of the idea of where this is located, it's when we looked at the housing plan, um, when we were talking about this, it was a big um, uh, issue in town. We had a housing production plan and so forth. And the idea was to put it close to things like a little a store somewhere or somehow um, with near is transportation or and if it was for over 55 it was for you know for their uh, um, ability to access places and things also now we have these 46 Joe, Joe, units can I stop for a second there's I'm, all, I'm, I'd like to concentrate people, on the environmental mm -hmm. issues tonight all so right. the, I'm, I'm just gonna say they're walking this it's unsafe the whole area is going to be unsafe that street we've had police cars even have accidents on that street and when you go down that street, there's no place on either side to even like balance on the side of the road. You have to be on the road. So we've got whether you've got um, families and, and they may, maybe they've got a little some paths there for, for walking in the conservation. Maybe that's capping. But then they have to walk on the road to go anywhere, to have a, a, even a walk. Then any, I don't know, any number of children could be there. These are families now. Joan, two and three Joan I'm going to stop you right now. I, he's, I'm, tonight, he's, we're, we're dealing with the environmental issues, okay? Next month, you can make your final argument. Uh, I'll be in Florida. <laughs> well, then you, you can do it in I writing can, if you uh, wish. Okay, okay. one more meeting. Is that what it is? Well, we're going to talk, talk about that in a little while, okay. but, but you, you can certainly put anything well, in writing. Okay, to me... I, I really want to just concentrate on environmental issues. Just environmental. Yes. Which okay. I need to understand anyway, so... Well... <laughs> All right. Thank you. I, I, I think we had a pretty good explanation. Mm -hmm. Even though a lot of it is technical, I think we've yeah. had a good explanation. But thank you. All right. Anybody else on an environmental issue? Yes. Uh, 
Kathy Vandenboom, 109 Morse. I'm not sure if this is what you mean by environmental issue, but would the bridge uh, that's built over the river be appropriate to speak about now, or is that at another time? <laughs> I, I, think it, I, I think another time. Okay. Um, in, in part because Mr. Buckley's not here, because if you had any structural questions or things okay. that would go to his area. Okay. okay. He just responded where Unit 10 is, there's going to be a lot of fill brought in, the, in that corner where NC4 is. Okay. I mean, okay. See how many feet they didn't have it in front. But yeah, the, I thought would, that that's the area that, that he was you. talking about. There'll be just a lot of fill brought in in that corner. Okay. So we'll, if we, do, if we approve this, we'll add a condition we need a lot of fill, right? Just a lot. <laughs> y yes. Okay. Well, we, we'll get specific. Here. Okay. Um, Best we can do for now. Final chance from all of us. Uh, any questions for Mr. Parker, for Mr. Brennan? No, thank you. No, I'm all set, thank you. No. no. Dave, you're um, all set? Yeah. Okay. Uh, did stormwater part of this, or that's what you're to? Okay, and one more. Um, snow removal. Maybe. Okay, I want to make a recommendation. Well, um, um, three to six feet. He just said three number. to six feet of three fill feet. in that location. I thought you were talking about snow. <laughs> <laughs> Our um, next hearing session is January 19th. And what I would like to recommend and it's obviously subject to our discussion, is that on that night we reach a consensus, consensus whether to approve or deny the application. And regardless whether the consensus is to approve or deny, we will take a formal vote at the February 16th meeting either to grant or deny the comprehensive permit as set forth in a written decision. So our discussion of the matter on the 19th will allow for comments from the public and from the applicant's representatives. I'm going to limit that ideally to, to one hour in duration um, concerning the application and concerning the um, proposed conditions and mitigation measures. So essentially, on the 19th, a month from tonight, we deliberate and reach a consensus as to whether we should approve or deny. Um, Judy will be drafting the report, the decision, and whether that's whether our consensus has been to approve or deny on the on the 16th of February, we then vote to um, to accept the decision as written, which again may be a denial, may be an approval. Okay. So, really, what I'm looking towards is. Um, <coughs> In essence, even though we would be meeting again in February on this, but really wrapping it up for all intents and purposes next month in January. So that's just a recommendation on my part, a proposal on my part. Um, and I'd like to see what my colleagues feel about that. Um, if you want to make a decision tonight, we can make a decision tonight too. But um, I think we need you know, some time to review mm -hmm. all the materials. Mm -hmm. Um, each of us to individually think about it and then to spend some time discussing it. Mm -hmm. So, go ahead. Okay, so I have, I'm definitely not ready to make a decision right now. I was sort of kidding. But. Yeah, okay. <laughs> sort of. uh, and I guess one thing I just wanted to address for, for anyone that's here, anyone that's listening, is anyone who sits on this board for more than a month or two, you really learn really fast. You cannot come into this thinking. And it, whether it's this or whether it's like earlier we heard an oversized garage. So we, you really cannot come into and sit back here and think, I know what I'm going to do. You really don't until you've heard it all. And you can come in thinking maybe yes, maybe no. And then as everything goes and you have all the information. So I, I can't only speak for myself, but no, I'm 100% not ready to make 
any sort of vote because mm -hmm. I need to review all of a, a, every single thing because I absolutely haven't made up my mind on this yet. Um, so I do have a question for you. So, so what you are proposing, uh, Barney, for next month would be um, that we have public comments, mm -hmm. we hear from the applicant, and then you <clears> said <throat> one hour. Is it one hour for the applicant, one hour for the public? I'd like to look total because I want to give us as much time as we need. Okay, so combined for public input yeah. and the applicant would be one hour and the rest of the meeting would be for yeah. us to deliberate. And yeah. at the end of that deliberation, you're proposing that we vote. Yes. We have <coughs> two hearings. Next month? We do. Question. They're not here yet, but I'm expecting them. Okay. okay. One's an appeal of the building commissioner and one's conversion of static to electronic billboard. Well, it might be a longer night. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It might be a longer night. I'm making a note oh. bring candy. I'm going to need some candy. Yeah, Kurt's going to bring some sky. There you go. <laughs> okay, and so then, um, so then if I'm understanding you then if we were to let's just so I understand if we were to vote I'm going to ask you questions about if we were to vote yes then I'm going to ask you questions about if we were to vote no just so that I'm understanding this mm -hmm. if we were to decide at the end of our deliberation that we're moving forward with a yes then Judy Barrett would go forward writing the decision mm -hmm. as a yes that would include the conditions that we've been discussing and then we would go over to make sure that all of the conditions that we'd been talking about and all taking notes on were, say, included and that we agreed with the, the verbiage. Or, or we may decide that um, we want additional conditions or that some of them that Judy has written we don't need. But, but that's okay. what we would be doing in, okay. in February. In other words, Judy would give us a draft decision <coughs> that we would then, in, in essence, finalize at the February meeting. Okay. And so if we were to vote no mm -hmm. in January, the same would be true. Right. We would vote no. Uh, obviously, there would be would no conditions her, that would be in it, but yes. Yes, but that would give her the time to put together the, the draft, if, and then we go over, review it, and yep. to agree with it. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm going to have to ask Judy if she's fine mm -hmm. with that, but th that's what okay. I'm proposing. Okay. David? I would be looking for direction from the board. Yes. If you decided to deny, it's a different decision. So it really becomes a question of the findings in the decision that the board would be making in order to justify the denial. Sorry, Judy, can you say that again? I'm sorry. Sure. So the decision to approve is a decision that's conditional. So the conditions are laid out in the decision and they're typically tied to different phases of the project. If it's a decision to deny, there's no conditions, it's a denial. And then really the guts of the decision, if you will, are about why the decision is denied. You know, you got findings of fact that they either err on the side of approval or denial. Judy, uh, from a time frame, does that work for you? Yes, it does. Okay. Thank you. Would, Judy, would we have the, uh, I guess we'll call it your draft, um, a week or two before the... Uh, the 19th? Yeah, I should be able comment to... Comment back to you, you know, uh, about anything, you know. Yeah, I should be able to have it to you at least a week ahead of time. So I probably wouldn't give you the entire decision, but I'll give you the findings and the conditions yeah and, and, you know because that's really the guts of the decision. yeah not not all the other we met two times and all these things yeah. um okay I, I think it's a um a good direction bonnie yeah that's something similar dave to what we did with um you know the domain um yep. and i think it worked out you know well in that regard i know that when we um you know, we, when we had a final meeting on it, you know, we did make some changes to the um, to the written decision. But um, the individuals who were writing it certainly had the um, you know the clarification as as to what was necessary to put in that draft. 
So I think it worked out well there. That's why I'm suggesting yeah. it again. Uh, Kurt, if, any thoughts? If I may, Mr. Chairman. I, oh. No, let me, let me finish with these guys. Okay. When you're, yeah. okay. Uh, nothing additional tonight, Bernie. Okay. Lorraine, any thoughts on that? No, I'm all set. It's fine. Okay, now you can talk. Go ahead. Thank you. As in past comprehensive permits, when drafting conditions, we, when working with the applicant, we certainly offer um, Stephanie Kiefer's uh, experience in working with Judy and uh, drafting some of the conditions. Uh, I know uh, environmental partners wrote conditions for it, but certainly a lot of those were undoable uh, in phasing of the project. So we certainly offer Stephanie's experience with working with Judy. Okay, thank you. Uh, I know some hands were raised. Any questions? I was just wondering if, if did you have a Could you, meeting on? So, so they can, no, no, can you come up there so they can hear you on the, they, they can't hear you unless you're in front of a mic. Did you have a meeting that had safety as the issue? I'm sorry? Did you have a meeting that one of the topics was safety? Did we have a meeting that one of the topics was safety? I mean, I think that's been an overriding concern throughout. Okay. Um, well, I'm just thinking that's children and around water, if there's any town or state requirements when you have a multifamily and is wa open water, right? I don't know. Like if you build around J Jamaica Pond or something, and <laughs> is that uh, any kind of... Uh, <laughs> How do I answer that? It's a, we, 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 we have no control over state issues. No. Okay. So we can only deal with, with local regulations. Uh, I don't know whether that would, what it comes under, actually. <clears throat> I would have thought it would have had some kind of a provisions when you, I don't know. I know it's private property, but it's, um, you know, providing multi-housing. We are either allowing it or not or, or in the long run there. So I just wondered if there was... And, you know, it's, we did talk about the buses and things like that, and about the road, <coughs> but I just didn't know if we had a, a um, that issue was, to me, it's important, and it seems like there's a lot of um, units here that um, we're concerned about, and putting, where, putting it where it is, that's... Well, um, let, me, let me say this. You, well, you said you won't be here next month, but you're entitled, obviously, to put... Everybody put is entitled to put something in writing to us. But we will address issues yeah. in our own deliberations. Okay. Okay. We'll see if I get it all down. Thank you. So you'll have all the information. Very good. Um, anything else? Kathy, yes. So I guess I'm just wondering, no one can hear, so I'll go real close to this, um, why we can't talk about some of the other issues tonight, why this one can only, I, I know you said in the next meeting we would just do an hour, but this is a public hearing and there's people, you know, that will watch it on TV and, and are interested in some of the topics, and I just am concerned that some of the topics won't get addressed, um, and we're here. And one of the, I think one of the topics, the two that I'm most concerned about is, you know, environmental partners did list that they would like a sidewalk to Morse Place. Um, and the other is that new wave, new, um, not waivers, but Mr. Kasparov submitted, um, are they waivers? I can't think of the right term. Right. What, some of them looked like the same, so I was wondering if you could go over what was different, what was new, in that list of waivers where they, I don't think they were all new. So what, what new waivers did he add? Are those, are those things that we could discuss tonight? No, we're not gonna discuss it tonight. We'll, okay. we'll discuss that, let, let me put it this way. If we, if our consensus is to deny the application, yeah. um, those waivers are moot. Right. Okay. If our consensus is to approve the application, we're going to have to make a decision on the waivers themselves. So right. we'll, we'll go over those. But I guess and, my... And yeah. we'll let you know which <clears throat> ones might be different than what was initially um, in, in, in the application initially. Okay. But it, so it, but it wouldn't be a value to hear from the public about, you know, which, 
what the concerns are about those waiver, the changes in the waivers or what the new waivers are. That's not a con a something I mean, you'll, you'll have the opportunity to address those with us. I, I, I think, let me put it this way. We've been on this for six months. Mm. And um, I think, and I think my colleagues share it, we're, we're ready to, to make a decision, whatever that decision may be. Okay. Um, every thing that has been presented to us in one fashion or another we will consider. Every comment, every concern, every question. It doesn't mean we're going to respond directly to every comment, question, mm -hmm. or concern, but in one fashion or another that will come under our deliberations. Okay. All right. Now, for example, you asked about snow removal before. Yeah. Uh, we may not. I, I, if, if we approve something, that <coughs> might be in the conditions. I mean, that's something that um, Judy will be considering as she drafts a decision, and ultimately, it's something in our view of that draft that we will either say yes or no to, and we'll have a reason for saying yes or no to. So one way or another, we will address the concerns that have been brought to our attention. That's one reason why, and again, I was being half, half facetious, um, one reason why I do want a month before we sit down and discuss this, because I want all of us, and believe me, I'm certainly going to do it myself, is to go through everything that we've received so far. Um, I've got it all here. It's all on the website. I'm going to read everything again. Certainly, if I have any questions about anything, we're, I'm going to raise it, and, mm -hmm. and we're going to discuss it. And I'm sure that my colleagues will do the same. Okay. So, as again, um, rest assured that we're going to, to do our best to address the various concerns and issues and comments. Again, it may not be directly and individually, yeah. but it will all come under the, uh, the ages of what we're going to determine. Okay. Okay. I, I, I just think that sometimes when the public is allowed to speak, you get a certain sense of the passion for which people have. I, I've written to you. I, you know my, I've written it all. You know my thoughts. But I've, I've seen members that are here come up and speak passionately about things like safety. And I know we're not going there, but I, I, I think that that needs to be heard. From I think it has a different take than somebody writing something that says, I would like sidewalks. I think a personal experience um, is helpful. So that, that's just what I did not want to see get missed mm -hmm. um, in just writing into the ZBA. You, we write them into record, but we don't read them. So some, I just. We, we, we read them, though. No, you read them, but yeah. th we don't read them to the public. So mm -hmm. um, I, I just want to make sure that, that, that the passion that some of these people feel um, is heard. Okay. Yes? Just to be clear, my next meeting. Because they can't hear you. <laughs> Carl Vandenboom, Moore Street. Uh, just to be clear, the next meeting, um, all topics are on the table. When you say all topics, meaning? Environmental, safety. You, you, can, you, you can raise whatever objections, concerns you have. Okay. Um, I, I have a list in my own mind of, let me put it this way. Um, I, I say that a lot. I know that. I probably shouldn't. Um, I, I pretty much know where the opposition to this proposal is. I mean, as um, I've been waiting for this one. As Bob Dylan wrote and sang, you don't have to be a weatherman to know which way the wind blows. But I want to give not just you, but anybody in the public the opportunity to reiterate your concerns and questions. And maybe because of the things that you've heard over the course of the last six months, things that you haven't raised, you, you now want to raise. I want to give everybody that opportunity, give us the opportunity to listen to you, and then address those matters. And again, it may not be we're going to address every point minutely, but we will be addressing those concerns and those issues. OK. Just so you know, some, some things are transparent from the public side, too, to what we see up here. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you guys go back and watch your meetings after. On occasion, Maybe I do. for historical or, you know, yeah, facts. On occasion, I do, whether I will go back over the last six months, over the course of the next month or not. 
I, I don't know, but on, on occasion I do. You know, particularly if I feel that I misunderstood something or I missed something and I want to clar have it clarified in my own mind. And, and I'm sure that the others do, you know, do as well. Okay. You know, frequently, and it ha has nothing to do with this matter, mm -hmm. but frequently when I write a decision, um, just to clarify a point that needs to be made in the written decision, I'll go back and listen. Okay. So. All right, I'll have some uh, issues, concerns okay. to address the next one. Okay, thank, thank you. Happy holidays. Yes. Thank you. Um, Bonnie. Motion, uh, is that sort of the Bonnie. consensus as to how we want to? I think Dave has some. Oh. Bonnie, uh, two things, I'll just respond. Uh, I, I do watch some of the, the hearings as well, not all of them. Um, the, the second comment is, I believe the new list of waivers uh, pointed at the fact that the project has been scaled back some, and to take that into account with uh, setback requirements and uh, size of buildings. And that's all I have. Okay. So... Hey, Dave, Dave, could, could you repeat the comment on the waivers? Because not everybody heard you clearly. <clears throat> well, I think the, um, make sure I'm not, not on mute. The, uh, the, the new list of waivers reflects mostly on the fact that the project has been scaled back some with less units with less buildings. And I think that um, changed some of the uh, factual part of the uh, waivers, not so much the need for new waivers. Did that come through? Yeah. Um, Just saying, I went, through, I went through that list quite a bit because I was wanted to see if anything was being uh, added or eliminated that didn't seem correct. I think we added a couple. There were a couple that were added. Based on landscaping? Yeah. And sidewalks? Yeah. And because of the revision in the plan. So just they were updated. But the basics? The basics were the same. Were the same. Yeah, there was nothing. They were based on the revision plans of October. Okay. I mean, we'll go through them. Yeah. So, consensus-wise, as far as that as the approach? I think it's good. Dave, you're all set with that as the approach? Yes. So that's the direction we'll go in then next month. So I guess what I need now is just a motion to continue the public hearing for January 19. Actually, before you do that, um, if the weather is frightful, um, I, I don't want to have that discussion with us on Zoom. I know we can do that. Yeah. You know, I, I want us here, at least us here. Mm -hmm. So if the weather, for any reason, prohibits us from meeting that night, um, I'm going to have to get in touch with you, get an extension, so that we can then do it. Absolutely. Either in February or maybe we can find a night to have a special meeting. Absolutely. Uh, between that. Okay. I totally agree. I really would prefer to do this in person if yeah. at all possible. Yeah. yeah. It would be and much I, easier. Uh, I will make every effort to be at that meeting. Um, I think you all are aware that I have some issues that sometimes make me not particularly mobile, and that's what I ran into today. Dave, if I have to pick you up, I'll pick you up. <laughs> okay. Remember you said that. I didn't mean physically pick you up. I mean, get you into my car. <laughs> I, get, I get it. I get it. Um, motion to continue. To I move to continue the meeting until uh, January. Hearing, public, hearing. public hearing until January 19th. Dave, second? Second. Uh, Kim? Yes. Dave? Yes. And Barney, yes. Um, so we'll see you on January 19th. Um, joyful and holiday season for everybody and best of us for the new year. Uh, we have anything else? There would be the two new hearings plus the continuing. <coughs> we'll talk about it.
And so, Diana, you said, I'm sorry, you said they're not in yet, but what might they be? One is a appeal of a building commissioner decision to do with some kind of outdoor storage on Spring Street. And the other is conversion of a billboard static to electronic. Well, maybe we can convince the um, converters to wait till February. <laughs> I know. I don't think we, we don't have the appeal. When, when's the deadline? Is it next week or? I told everybody by next uh, Thursday. Wednesday. Thursday. It is something. It's around there anyway. Because the we're closed Friday. The appeal hasn't come in. Oh, no, yet? I've talked to her like four times, so she's coming in. Okay. All right, um, motion to adjourn. I move we adjourn. Second. Second. Okay, we all vote on this. Uh, Lorraine. Yes. Kim. Yes. Kurt. Yes. Dave. Yes. And Barney, yes. Judy, I'll be in touch. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Merry Paige, Christmas. Uh, Paige, I'll be in touch. Thanks.